Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's virtual education webinar. I'm Trisha O'Neill, the National Director of Track Development for the National Pancreas Foundation. The National Pancreas Foundation's mission is to provide hope for those suffering from pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer through funding cutting edge research, advocating for new and better therapies, and providing support and education for patients, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Some of our featured programs include the Animated Pancreas Patient, state chapters that assist with education, fundraising, and patient support groups, and our physician programs that include research grants, medical education, and our annual fellow symposium. We are always looking for volunteers to help support our mission. For more information on how to get involved, please email us at info at pancreasfoundation.org. Tonight's program will cover pancreatic cancer, how can we make something treatable that is untreatable, a multidisciplinary approach. Special thanks for our presenters this evening from the University of Colorado, Anschutz Medical Center, Dr. Marco Del Chiaro and Dr. Wells Messersmith. We will begin tonight with Dr. Del Chiaro. Dr. Del Chiaro is currently professor and division of chief of surgical oncology in the Department of Surgery at the University of Colorado on Anschutz Medical Campus. Dr. Del Chiaro is also director of the pancreatic program and medical director for NPF's designated Academic Center of Excellence for Pancreatic Cancer at the University of Colorado. Dr. Del Chiaro has extensive experience in the treatment of locally advanced pancreatic cancer, as well as in the treatment of precancer pancreatic lesions. He is author of more than 220 publications in peer-reviewed international journals and, when, and was recognized in 2021 by expert Scape as one of the world experts in pancreatic neoplasms. During the presentation tonight, please use the Q&A section to ask your questions and they will be addressed at the end of our presentation. Thank you again, all of you for supporting the mission of the National Pancreas Foundation. Thank you, should I, should I start? Yes, you can start, thank you so much. So first of all, I wanna obviously thanks the National Pancreatic Foundation for uh, inviting us and also for this uh, great, incredible contribution that you are giving every day for patients affected by pancreatic cancer, pancreatitis, and in general, pancreatic diseases. I'm, this night here, I have the honor uh, to be with all of you and I have the honor to have as a, my co-speaker, Dr. Messersmith. Dr. Messersmith is professor of Oncology and Division Chief of Medical Oncology at University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And also for our uh, health system, which is UCH Health System, the CMO of, surgical of Oncology Services. So he's really the star this night, even if I'm the one introducing um, this, uh, this webinar. And uh, it's the star also because in the last year, I believe that oncology and medical oncology especially has gained really the role of the king in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. And probably we need to oncologist the big improvement we had in the last years. So I start to share my screen um, and start in my presentation. Can you see my screen? All right. So um, here I have uh, my conflict of interest to declare. Um, so, Everyone knows that pancreas cancer is a big problem. The incidence of pancreas cancer is not so big. So that means that it's not one of the most frequent cancer, but still it represents now the third cause of cancer related death in the United States. And is estimated to be the cause number two within 2030. So many authors define it pancreatic cancer a medical emergency. And actually it's probably true. On the right side of the screen, you see the data from the PANC org that say that the five-year overall survival of pancreatic cancer patient reached this year 10%. We are speaking now about the overall pool of patients with pancreatic cancer. So this is a big problem because we have still a pretty poor survival in patients affected by this disease. Why pancreas cancer is so problematic? Well, Pancreas cancer generally gives symptoms when it's late. So he has time to develop, to progress, to spread before giving notice of his presence in the body. There is a general low level of knowledge of high risk groups and precancerous lesion. 
And that's probably could be the topic of another webinar because I don't want to now focus my attention here, but I'm pretty sure if someone of you has the occasion to speak even with doctors, so people working in healthcare, very few can give you really information about precursor lesion of pancreatic cancer, which are frequent, but many times underestimated. There is a relatively low response rate to chemotherapy. Dr. Messers will touch, I'm sure at this point, much better than me. And mostly, almost every patient has a systemic involvement at the moment of diagnosis. So this is, I wanna show you something peculiar. You know, this is a curiosity. In the 70s, we believed that probably surgery should not be done for pancreas cancer because we didn't have results. But incredibly, this picture came from a meeting I attended in 2018, an international meeting. An international, very well-known surgeon, a very pretty famous surgeon for pancreatic disease told why we don't stop to do surgery for pancreatic cancer patients. was a very provocative question, obviously, but that's reflect that in our mind, nothing really changed very much between the 70s and today. Is that really true or is something different? I wanna show you some picture. This is a survival. I don't pretend, I mean, the people look the numbers or look the curves, but so this is how patient with resected pancreas cancer represented by the red line survival change over the year. Nothing is changed. Well, from the 70s to the 2011, we had an increase in survival of 1000%. If we look also what happens compared to the last 10 years, compared to the 70s, that is an increase of 1,700% in survival rate in pancreas cancer. So it's not enough, for sure not, but we cannot say we didn't do improvement in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Now, you see, there are two peak in changing prognosis in pancreas cancer. And I generally divide this, this peak and this period of time in era one, era two, era three, and that's I divided my presentation. Now we speak even of era four. So what is in front of us for the future? Era one basically was the one in the hand of surgeon. That's why it didn't went so well. And we basically told, okay, only tumor that are confined to the pancreas without infiltration of the major blood vessel around the pancreas can be resected. That represents 20% of patients. The one with infiltration of vessel, 30%, should not be resected. The one with metastasis should not be resected. The history of pancreas cancer is made of staging on local disease, how the disease is big, how the vessels are infiltrated. But I believe, and this is a personal opinion, that that doesn't make so much sense because we know that all patients with pancreas cancer has two more cells circulating in the blood at the moment of diagnosis. So we focus, as you can see here in the right side of the screen, on a point when the disease is in all the body. And that's, I think, is one of the reasons why we fail to make so many progress in pancreas cancer treatment. We focus too much on what happens in the pancreas, too few on what happens in the body of the patient. The big step that changed from era one to era two was at the beginning of the, the let's say, latest 90s, when we understood that doing surgery followed by chemotherapy was improving survival of patients with pancreas cancer. Before, we didn't do basically chemotherapy and the results were pretty disappointing. This is one of the first really prospective randomized trial. And I'm sorry for Dr. Messers being run by surgeons, but still in enhancing the role of chemotherapy as a key. So the systemic control as a key in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. There was another important step in that period of time. We decided to don't consider pancreas cancer surgical disease, but a medical disease. So things should be done together in a multidisciplinary approach and mostly in a multidisciplinary dedicated conference. What does it mean? I have a tumor board, it's not enough. You need to have a dedicated pancreas multidisciplinary clinic. That's a result from our, and you see how many times for pancreas diagnosis, treatment, staging changed when the patient came to us after being evaluated in another no specialized center before. So huge difference because working together and putting all the aspects together give us better outcome. This is our model. I don't wanna be so going so in detail, but what we do is generally, we have a short time of waiting. If you wanna book an appointment with us, we have one day in which the patient come in the morning, complete all the assessment need to be done. For example, CT scan. Then at noon, all the provider has 
a meeting in a room where we present case by case. In the afternoon, the patient meet the doctors and come home with a plan. That could be chemotherapy, starting with, which generally is our preferred approach, followed by surgery. Now, another important step in the era two has been that you should not be treated for pancreas cancer everywhere. You should select the high volume center. That's reduced mortality. So you have less risk to die for an operation or having complication if you're treating high volume center. There is a big volume, big body of volume of literature showing that. This is evidence, it's not opinion. So if you have pancreas cancer, you need to find the right place to be treated. Also very important is that being treated in a specialized center, this is an intriguing paper published a few years ago showing that you may need to travel from where you are, but if you travel, your chance to survive longer is higher. So you increase survival going to the right center instead of trying to find the treatment nearby home. Well, if you have a good center nearby home, perfect. But if you don't have, it's worth to travel and to move to have a better outcome. And Still in the era two, we need to thanks for the development of our results. A foundation like the Pancreas National Foundation that decide to put together advice for patients and telling them, okay, you have a problem, that's the place where you should go. And this is a remarkable step that has been done in the treatment of pancreas cancer, helping people to select the right places. In era three, we had something better our chemotherapy became better. And I don't wanna to go too much in detail because I'm sure Dr. Masters will speak about that, but now with multi-agent chemotherapy, we have definitely better survival. Better survival means that the local stage, the vessel involvement, whatever is visible anatomically does make, make much less sense. And biology of the tumor make more, make more sense because we are more and more often able to control the disease from a systemic standpoint. In radiological status, so discriminating patient between vessel infiltration or no vessel infiltration, in fact, doesn't play a big role. We know that we have a pathological response in almost 75% of patients treated with Fulfredinox, but we have only a 25% radiological response. That means to make easy, you do Fulfredinox, in your CD scan, nothing change, but maybe your CA99 in the blood go down. Well, there is a good chance that you can have a successful operation, even if, the CT scan doesn't show any regression because unfortunately CT scan is unable to catch regression properly in pancreatic cancer. And then you can extend your resection even in patients where vessels are involved. So basically we have data today that say that one, the tumor still appear unresectable at the CT scan. In more than 90% of patients it's still possible to do a radical resection. So absence of radiological response is not a contraindication for surgery. And therefore today we know the patient affected by what, by what we call borderline or locally dense pancreatic cancer in selected cases should be considered for resection even without a radiological response. Radiological infiltration of peripancreatic vessel. So superior mesentery vein, superior mesentery artery, hepatic artery is not necessarily a prognostic factor. Pancreatectomy with vascular resection or a reconstruction can be proposed in those patients in selected cases once we obtain a systemic control through chemotherapy. But those operations cannot be done everywhere. And that's, I think, will link to a point in era four, which is the future. Era four is, in my opinion, identifying, considering that today we have more hope for those lesions, not only the eye volume center, that is not enough to be, let's say, qualified completely for those operations. There are many high volume centers can do, some high volume centers, they don't have necessarily experience in that. So qualifying specialized center or super specialized center in doing this operation. And this has been very well stated by the Japanese Society of Hepatopancreatic Obiliary Surgery in a recent position paper, where they specify that those operations should be done in really qualified center to do this operation. That could be a very next important step, for example, for the National Pancreatic Foundation to try to identify those center and uh, basically suggest this kind of a second opinion. I believe in the era four, so in the future, neoadjuvant treatment should become the standard of care, not only for patients with vascular involvement, because 
is not anatomy that makes the difference, but it's the disease that makes the difference. So we want to select the best patient for surgery. We don't want to do unnecessary surgery. So chemotherapy can select those patients. We can control better the systemic disease. And we can also guarantee chemotherapy on patients that maybe after surgery, they are too compromised to get quickly a chemotherapy regimen. And maybe in the near future, we can assist in pancreas cancer, something we already assisted for colonic cancer. When I was a young resident, the patient that came in our hospital with colonic cancer and liver metastasis was considered palliative care. Today, we have chance of treatment. And with the improvement of chemotherapy, I believe in the future, maybe even pancreatic cancer with metastasis could be approached for a curative treatment once we will have better treatment. There are already some reports, and here I don't want to go into detail, but there are already in very selected cases, patients that with metastatic pancreatic cancer can reach a significant level of survival, of course, in very selected cases, and so they can live longer compared to what was the past. And I want to just show you the last slides in which you see that in the last year we increased, we saw an increased number of patients treated surgically, even with metastatic disease and also a consent, a consequent increase in overall survival of those patients. Saying that, I just closed my part. I really thank you for listening. And I'm more than happy to introduce Dr. Messersmith uh, to uh, go ahead and discuss more on the medical and uh, oncological part of this uh, problem. Great, thank you, Marco. I really, really appreciate it. Let me see if I can share my screen here. And just let me know if you can see it. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, as Marco said with his kind introduction, my name is Wells Messersmith and I am a medical oncologist um, specializing in gastrointestinal um, cancers. I um, trained at Johns Hopkins and finished there in 2004 and I was on faculty there for a couple of years prior to coming here in 2007. It's really been nice to see um, the program grow. These are my uh, disclosures. I, I do do a lot of clinical trials, including first in human. Um, and I also participate in some of the data safety monitoring boards. So um, if we think about the historical approaches to pancreatic cancer, and I, I included a review on the left-hand side here. Um, and Marco, let me know if you can see my mouse. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but. Um, we see it. Okay, great. You can see that historically, the um, outcomes were just very poor. Um, if you look at the survival rates, and as Dr. Del Chiaro mentioned, we're just topping 10% sort of overall, uh, but these were even patients who were resected, 10% uh, at two years with observation in some of these historical um, trials. And so that's really caused us to try to look at this disease in a different way. And one of the issues with the old approach, um, as Marco mentioned, which is to do surgery, and then to follow that up with, with chemotherapy, is that um, uh, when you do that, the most life-threatening aspect, which is metastatic disease, micrometastatic disease, those sort of little asterisks in the body that Marco was um, showing, um, that is left untreated for three months. And if you think about it, it's really not the pancreatic tumor itself that um, ends up taking someone's life. It's usually the metastatic disease, the, you know, that's spreading to the liver or spreading to the lungs or other areas that, um, that can shorten someone's life. And the other issue is that after surgery, patients are often weakened, um, recovering from surgery by the time the chemotherapy starts. And in many trials, only about half the patients actually um, get the chemotherapy. Um, the other issues, um, as Dr. Del Chiara mentioned, there's often margin, positive margins, especially in less experienced hands. We don't want to see that. So when we say positive margins, what we're saying is that when the tumor is taken out and the pathologist is looking at it under the microscope, they see cancer cells right where uh, the, the cut on the tumor was made, meaning that there's cancer left behind in the body. And of course, we want to avoid that as much as possible. And um, finally, a lot of patients come in and they, they don't appear to be operable. So if you take that approach, you're gonna be excluding a lot of patients uh, from, from curative therapy. Um, this is a uh, schematic a, a anatomical drawing from the same review, just showing that um, you, you get to higher levels of risk as you have an encasement, meaning the tumor is surrounding the entire vessel or um, involvement, uh, especially in the arterial side where it's maybe a budding, sort of touching it. 
and then um, coming down into the venous um, involvement or, or when it's clear of the vessel. So <clears throat> these are all the um, uh, very critical parts of the body that Dr. Del Chiaro is dealing with when he's doing an operation. And I'm very grateful that I can um, write chemotherapy orders on a computer and I'm not trying to put together <laughs> these critical arteries because um, I don't think I'd be able to do nearly as good of a job. Now, modern chemotherapy regimens do have increased cure rates. And as uh, Dr. Del Chiaro mentioned, Fulfirinox, which is this combination, and we're, we're too lazy to say every single word. So basically we, we spell out these acronyms and you can see that it used to be where you're using one drug at a time. So gemcitabine and then 5-FU, uh, this is folinic acid or folate. Uh, for some reason in the United States, we adopted leucovorin, which is the German term, but the full from uh, this acronym here comes from folate essentially. And then it's combined with 5-FU, arenatecan, and oxaliplatinum, and that's how we get this, um, uh, this acronym. But the um, survival really popped up in this study. So if you look historically, it was usually around 20 months, 20 months, maybe we come out to kind of the mid twenties here. And in this study, which is uh, a French study, fairly large study, nearly 500 patients, we finally got a survival of 54 months. And um, that's median survival, meaning half the patients actually live longer than that. And this is the curve that Dr. Del, Car Dr. Del Chiaro mentioned. We, we look at these things called hazard ratios. So if you're looking at these survival curves, ideally we want someone, we want our survival to be 100%. So ideally we'd have a straight line coming across the screen. And as time goes by with these months, um, you would have 100% of people would still be alive. And as the curves drop down and each one of these um, check marks is an event here, um, as they drop down, we want to be as high up towards 100% as we can get. So this modified fulfirinox regimen, um, this acronym as mentioned in versus gemcitabine, which at the time was the standard, um, the curve is higher. And so that's what we want to see. And we can measure this statistically with this thing called a hazard ratio. So basically the hazard ratio is measuring your hazard of death compared to whatever the control group is. And it's measuring the difference between these two curves uh, throughout. Um, and what you're seeing is that there's a, it, the hazard ratio is 0.64. What that means is that there's a 36% improvement. So it's basically one minus 0.64, 36% improvement in survival in, uh, in this study. And importantly, when we look at survival curves, we wanna see them flatten out because what that indicates is that perhaps we're curing people rather than just delaying um, the inevitable. Another regimen you may have heard about is gemcitabine and NAB paclitaxel. The data here is much less clear. Um, this trial was also a large trial and um, it involved multiple countries, whereas the last one was just a French trial. This one was sort of all over the world. So it's a little bit tricky to compare, but the initial results, you see the difference between the curves isn't really all that different. Um, but there seems to be a little bit of a trend that the combination arm with the napaclitaxel and the gemcitabine seems to be doing a little bit better than gemcitabine. So we'll see, this was in a sort of an initial report and we'll see what the, uh, the final report shows later. But if you're wondering why in, in the post-operative setting, so after someone's had surgery, why we favor fulfirinox a little bit over the gemcitabine and napaclitaxel, um, this is the reason. It's the difference between this curve, which where there's a clear difference, and this curve where the difference is much less clear. And I also wanted to, to touch base a little bit on, on radiation and go over this um, trial called the Alliance A021501. And um, this was a preoperative trial. So it's one of the first studies where they gave chemotherapy prior to surgery. And that it was asking a question of um, what about the role of radiation? And these were for borderline resectable. Dr. Del Caro's slide, he put BR, borderline resectable. That just means it's not, um, there's some involvement of vessels or things that's gonna make, make it somewhat more complicated to do the surgery. And this is how these trials are, are basically run. So you, you take patients with these borderline resectable pancreatic uh, cancers and the definitions of this can be found online and actually differ a little bit from, from national organization, national organization, but basically it means that there's blood vessels involved. And there's two arms to this trial. So 
you everyone got chemo and then restaging just means they got a scan. And then one arm got four cycles of chemo and the other arm got three and then had a short course of uh, radiation. And this is defined here where they gave uh, 40 gray. That's just measuring how much they're giving in five fractions. So short course just means we're giving it in five fractions, not five weeks, but really five days. Then they had another scan, then they had surgery. And then following um, a, a scan after surgery, they were given uh, this full pharynx minus the ERI, minus the renotechian. So then it becomes just full fox uh, for four cycles. So if you, if you look, this is two months, uh, the other four cycles would be two months, and then this would be another two months. So six months, which is the amount of time that they're giving chemotherapy in those other trials that I mentioned. The, um, statistically, this type of trial, it's much smaller. If you notice the, the other Fulferinox study I presented had nearly 500 patients. This one had only 62 patients per arm. And what that means is that they're not formally comparing the arms. They're just trying to get some preliminary data. Um, these are often called pick the winner type studies where it's not a formal comparison, but you're just kind of looking at two arms to see which one you should bring forward to perhaps develop with the larger trial. And so this, this is called a phase two trial, meaning it's more than phase one where things are initially being tried out, but, but less large of a trial than a phase three trial where there's a formal statistical comparison, but you're gonna need hundreds of patients. And um, we have primary and secondary endpoints in these trials. So the primary endpoint, you're basically saying, this is what our focus is. We're looking at overall survival at the 18th month, uh, month mark. And then secondary endpoints are other things you're gonna look at event-free survival, and then you're looking at this sort of composite endpoint of progression, whether or not they did a resection where there's obvious disease left behind or recurrence. Adverse events are basically just side effects. R0 resection rate, or when you have a complete surgical resection with clear margins, that means that the pathologist doesn't see any tumor cells um, where the surgeon has cut to remove something. And finally, the pathologic complete response rate, that means that when they take the specimen out and look at it, they really can't find any living tumor cells. And we often put in these things called interim futility analysis. What that means is we don't wanna enroll all 60 patients and find out that um, the study should have been stopped much earlier because it just wasn't working. So what they'll do is they'll um, temporarily halt the trial and then take a look at the initial data. And when they did this, the radi radiation arm was actually closed. Now, this is a small study. I'm not saying it's, it gives us the final word on radiation, but it is um, uh, sort of interesting data. And, and the um, National Cancer Institute actually stopped supporting um, studies with radiation for the time being until we could figure out what's going on. This is called a contour diagram. So basically what they're doing is just telling us what happened to the various patients. Um, the, the data in this study wasn't totally mature. So this is on 54 patients here, 56 patients here. This is arm B is the radiation arm. And you can see that in terms of the patients completing each of these steps, there's significant um, drop off as time goes on um, here. So um, it's something to pay attention to because no matter how a trial is designed, you sort of want to keep an eye on what's going on with patients and why patients are dropping off. So for instance, um, by the time we got to cycle eight, after we started with 65 patients, we ended up with 47 patients. And this is sort of telling us what happened. Maybe they had side effects, the disease got worse, progression uh, is kind of a misnomer. It means that the disease got worse. Physician choice or um, other. And this is why we get this drop off from here to here. So um, this is a way of tracking patients to see what's going on. And if you look at the baseline profile, this is what you tend to see in these trials in the United States. The patients are in their early 60s, usually a little bit younger than the median age of diagnosis. And unfortunately, you tend to get um, a overrepresentation of uh, white patients. And so there's a lot of thrust here to try to have these more uh, reflect the diversity of the US um, and, and so I think we're gonna see more diverse patient populations in, uh, in future trials. ECOG is zero, that just means is the patient feeling well and that, uh, you know, able to work and carry on their, their sort of activities of daily living. And then this was that CN199 that, that this is a glycosylated protein 
um, that Dr. Del Chiaro mentioned that we use to track patients. Normally the level should be less than 35 and the higher the number, the higher risk um, that it is. So you can see here, the numbers range from zero to 14,000 here, zero to 13,000, but the median was a little bit higher in the radiation arm. And if you look at the outcome here again, we're at these survival curves. As I said before, ideally we'd like it to be 100% all the way across. Um, but unfortunately, as patients, uh, this is a survival curve. So as patients pass away, the percent alive goes down. And the median um, it, it would be where, the, where it intersects the 50th percentile. In this case, we were looking at the rate at 18 months. Remember, that was the primary endpoint. So here, the rate here was actually much higher than the rate when they included the radiation therapy. Remember, the only difference between these two arms is that this group got one less cycle of fulfarinox and then received radiation therapy. Um, so basically did not meet the sort of pre-specified rate that they were looking for in the statistics. So um, as we kind of compare these, looking at the um, overall survival rate um, at 18 months, it was 66% versus 47%. And then the event-free survival were those events that we mentioned again, it was longer here um, between the two arms, arm A uh, did better. The resection rate was higher here. Um, and what was interesting about it is that the pathologic complete response rate, which usually represents how those patients are gonna do, ended up being higher when you got radiation and yet the survival was less. And that's not commonly seen. Um, so there's something going on there that I'll touch on in a minute uh, where we've been trying to look at it with our preclinical studies. And then the preoperative uh, grade three or four, that means fairly, you know, somewhat severe adverse event rate, that could be things like low blood counts, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that kind of stuff, was around 15 57% versus 64%, so a little bit higher um, in, in that R. And there's a sort of consensus regarding radiation, and depending on where you're being treated, you, you sort of have people who are strong believers, people are kind of in the middle, um, for now, we've kind of halted the routine use of radiation. We do use it if somebody has a positive margin or something. But um, if you kind of look through many of the trials, um, radiation has either been harmful or had no benefit. And so for that reason, we've sort of held off um, on using it routinely. We do use it in certain um, cases. There are some um, places though that, that track their own data and they, they tend to have better experiences with it. So they, they continue to use it despite the fact that the larger trials don't show benefit. And there's often debates as to, maybe it depends on exactly how it's given and how experienced the providers are, et cetera. Now, we've also looked, our group led by Sana Karam, who's in the upper left, who's a wonderful scientist who studies pancreatic cancer. She's a radiation oncologist. Um, and um, same with Adam Mueller, who trained in our program. Um, and they've been looking at why would we see this kind of strange thing where you seem to have higher metastases when you use radiation. And what they found is that there's uh, an increase when you, when you gave radiation therapy. In this case, it was just 10 gray. And these are organoids, which are these kind of little pockets of uh, cancer cells grown in a dish. Okay, you got higher expression of vimentin. Well, vimentin is one of these epithelial to mesenchymal transition markers. What that means is it's cells on the move. When you have EMT, your cells moving. And that was higher when they gave uh, radiation. They also found there's increased cell migration and uh, mechanical stiffness when um, radiation was given, all of which could be associated with higher metastases. Another thing that Dr. Karam did was um, look at uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells. So these are basically immune cells that you don't want. They're immune cells that are decreasing uh, the immune effect. And what they found was that there's an increase in activated myeloid derived um, suppressor cells when they gave radiation. Now, whether um, this applies outside of mice to humans, we're not totally sure. This is actually from humans showing that um, after radiation, there was higher MDSCs, but whether or not the stuff that they're looking at in mice applies, we're not totally sure. 
And um, fortunately, when you have a scientific question, what you wanna do is you wanna do a large trial. And here you can see this one has 322 patients, this has 368 patients. Um, and people might've caught the Priapank one paper was actually published, but unfortunately really just had gemcitabine, which doesn't really tell us much about modern regimens. But these trials should help us um, uh, answer the question as to what the role of radiation um, should be. So um, in conclusion, we, we definitely wanted to leave time for questions. And so uh, this will be my last slide. But in conclusion, more patients with localized pancreatic cancer are being cured than ever before. Um, and I think um, uh, it's probably multifactorial. First of all, improved staging, so figuring out who truly has localized disease versus widespread disease. As we get better scans and other tests, we're able to figure that out better. The chemotherapy um, has improved. It's not perfect. It, it needs more improvement, um, but it, it has improved uh, the ability to kill those little cells that might be spread through your body if you have pancreatic cancer that we can't see. Uh, remember, it takes about a million cells to see a one centimeter lesion. And so you could have 100 cells or 10 cells or even 1,000 cells and just not see it. And then finally, improved surgical techniques. Um, you know, Dr. Del Chiara and his team are able to resect things that were totally unresectable in the past. It's really been amazing to see how they're able to rebuild uh, the arterial blood supply or the venous blood supply, and oftentimes both, um, to make it uh, resectable. The best survivals in patients who are resected. So once you have visible disease, chemo cannot cure you alone, but it increases the cure rate after surgery. So basically chemotherapy is good as a, as a cleanup operation, but it's not gonna be able to cure a lesion in and of itself. Um, as I often tell patients, I deal with the forest and Dr. Del Caro deals with the trees. So I'm looking at a systemic level, he's looking at the actual tumor itself. Unfortunately, immunotherapy has not shown a benefit in pancreatic cancer. If you look at these, this new class of drugs called checkpoint inhibitors, and there are many of them, you might have seen the uh, uh, commercials on TV for a drug called pembrolizumab, um, and there's another one called nivolumab. These are basically immune stimulators, and they've, they've been FDA approved in about 20 different cancers, and have often shown to increase cure rate, but for some reason, they really have not worked in pancreatic cancer. And so there's ongoing trials, initially in advanced disease, and then will likely be brought into more localized disease um, in the future. There are some promising leads here and there, um, but we're not getting our hopes up until we see more definitive trials. And finally, there's perhaps a disruptive technology coming that's being looked at in, in clinical trials increasingly. And I've seen it, it ordered from clinic. You can order this, these tests called circulating tumor DNA. And what they're looking for is little bits of DNA that are circulating in, in your blood that would indicate that there's, a, there's some cancer cells in there. And um, one idea to use it is after surgery, it could tell you who still has cancer cells left behind and maybe help determine maybe who doesn't need um, as uh, chemotherapy or perhaps who should be looked at very closely and get very intensive um, uh, surveillance regimens with scans and blood tests, and who perhaps we can leave alone. All of this, we're still waiting on more definitive data. So it's not something that I use outside of a clinical trial routinely, but it is something that could be very promising down the road. And we also even have some vaccine studies where for patients who have a positive circulating tumor DNA test following um, all therapy, for pancreatic cancer, um, there are some uh, companies uh, looking at creating a vaccine for those patients to try to clear out whatever disease might be left over. So I'll go ahead and stop there. And, and then Dr. Del Chiaro and I would be delighted to um, take questions. And you're supposed to submit your questions in the Q&A section through the chat box would be fine too. I, I can start well to ask you uh, one question once you are waiting for, for our um, participant if, if they have any question for us. Uh, you, you actually touched the very intriguing point, which is the one of radiation therapy in pancreatic cancer. And you know, I agree with you. I mean, the study 
you show obviously was close for inferiority in the armor radiation. Obviously, as you mentioned, I mean, the number included are pretty low and also was analyzing only one type of radiation therapy, which is basically the SBRT. Now, saying that, I also agree with you that there are not so much evidence in general and literature of the role of radiation. So when in this moment, in 2022, at the light of all the study we, you mentioned and we had, when do you recommend, if ever, you recommend radiation to a patient with pancreatic cancer? Yeah, so it mainly boils down to um, uh, two situations. One is um, if the patient has had surgery and there's a positive margin. So we, we, we fear that there's cancer cells left behind. Fortunately, um, uh, you and other surgeons leave little clips behind as you're clipping off vessels. And so we're able to use that to help guide the radiation. And um, it, it's basically trying to clean up um, um, surgery. And then um, the other example would be in patients who are clearly unresectable, not going to be resectable just because there's extensive vessel involvement um, or the uh, disease is kind of crawling behind around the aorta or other things. We'll use radiation in that situation to try to um, uh, keep the tumor under control as long as possible. Um, so those are really the two situations. And I, I, uh, I clicked on the Q&A, it's actually different from the chat. And um, there are a couple of uh, questions which maybe yeah. we can we can sort through. Yeah, I, I think we can start with the with the second, third, and then maybe we can leave the, the first one. I think is related to pancreatitis, so probably you know um, is is not really uh, uh, completely uh, you know this, the the top the topic of this webinar. But I'm more than happy. I mean to discuss about that. If you want, I think, uh, well, so I can start to, to answer the number two. You can start the number three. You can go to number three, and then I can go back to the number one question. Sure. So the, the number two status of early detection. So uh, here is, I think there are two points to mention here. There are two groups of people that are suitable for early detection, prevention, early diagnosis, whatever you want to use here. You know, on general population, considering the low, low incidence of pancreas cancer is not cost effective to do any investigation. But there are two groups of people that potentially could benefit of that. One is people that there's a genetic risk to develop pancreatic cancer. What does it mean? It means having family member affected by pancreatic cancer, and there are precise criteria, or other disease, genetic disease that can expose to an increased risk of pancreas cancer. Example are hereditary breast cancer, hereditary melanoma, hereditary pancreatitis. Those people should be included in screening program. This is a small group of people, but there is, there is even a huge group of people. And that's what I was telling today when I told there is a low knowledge. So there is a very interesting study done in Germany on healthy population where they did an MRI, a pancreatic MRI, they identified cystic finding in the pancreas in almost 50%, 50% of population. Now we know that some of the cystic lesions of the pancreas are cystic tumor. Some of those like IPMN can progress very rarely, but can progress to cancer. So those people with those cystic lesions could benefit of surveillance program. And those lesions are visible. The problem is sometimes they're not even reported because, you know, small uh, would be a cyst. Our cysts of the pancreas are very rare. Cystic tumor of the pancreas are more frequent than normal cysts of the pancreas. So whoever get a diagnosis of a cyst in the pancreas, the suggestion is go in an expert center, be assessed, and eventually follow it over time if required. That's, I mean, I think are the two really biggest, you know, group that today can be suitable for early detection prevention of pancreatic cancer. Uh, Wells, do you wanna, I see, I see two questions on chemo and then I can sure. go to question. Yeah, well, while you're chatting there, uh, there's a question about high frequency ultrasound. So I was just uh, looking at the paper. So there, the, uh, there was a paper, uh, the question is what about the recent study on immunotherapy and high frequency ultrasound together as a potential treatment for pancreatic cancer? 
And um, I, I believe this is referring to a paper um, from Royal Marsden that, uh, by Mora Titus et al. Um, looking at pulse focused ultrasound um, and immune checkpoint inhibitors and pancreatic cancer. The issue is that that paper is done in mice. And so um, while it's a intriguing study and one that could be followed up on potentially in, in humans, unfortunately, there's a long record of curing mice of cancer and not uh, being able to translate that into actual uh, people. So I think it's, um, it's an interesting area and one hopefully where there'll be a clinical trial, but right now we don't, we don't use that. And then th there's another question, any new chemotherapy on the horizon? Um, I'd say there's a couple things to, to keep an eye on. One is um, uh, targeting KRAS. So it turns out that over 90 to 95% of patients with pancreatic cancer, their tumors will have a KRAS mutation. And there's seven KRAS mutations we typically see. They all start with the letter G because G is glycine and that is the one amino acid without a side chain. And it turns out that these um, cancers will have a mutation where another amino acid will be put on there and it, it prevents the, the gene from being turned off. So as a result, there's just constantly pulsing with growth signals. And there are multiple um, trials looking at uh, KRAS inhibition, where there's been some initial efficacy is G12C, i.e. a cysteine is substituted for the glycine. Turns out cysteine is a little bit easier to interfere with. And so there's uh, several compounds um, in development. They're initially starting with lung cancer, but some trials were recently, um, initial results were shown for pancreatic cancer, and there does seem to be some activity for that. G12C is a, is a fairly rare subtype, and so whether we'll have KRAS um, inhibitors that hit the other mutations like G12V, G12D, and some of these other ones uh, remains to be seen. And, um, but that's something to keep an eye on. So K-R-A-S, KRAS, um, it seems to be very, very common in pancreatic cancer. It's, it's mutated in about 35% of all cancers, but as I said, over 90% of pancreatic cancer. So that's one. Second is um, vaccines. So there's interest in developing vaccines, perhaps to mutated KRAS. Um, and so um, those trials are being developed now. Some of them are even open. Um, third would be combinations of other immune checkpoint inhibitors. So the most common ones that I mentioned, the pembrolizumab and the bolimab, those do not work alone. Um, but perhaps when combined with other modalities um, can uh, get better responses. And so there's a, a number of um, studies looking at novel combinations or um, uh, that type of thing. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Wells. I, I see some other questions. So I want to go to the question number one because I don't want to, and then there are so other, even in the chat, please try to put your question in Q&A because I mean, otherwise, uh, you know, I just opened by chance the chat and there are a couple of questions even there. Anyhow, regarding the necrosis of the pancreas, I believe, and uh, you know, uh, please tell me if I'm correct or not, I believe that this is related to an acute pancreatitis that results in a necrosis of the pancreas. Is that correct? Can can just the, the order of question number one answer me real time? So I, I'm just uh, sure about that. So, you know, there is really not an accepted treatment. If you want, what I can tell you is that what we consider today the best treatment is what we call the step up approach, which means that you start with the mi minimally invasive approach to the drain, the necrosis, which could be percutaneous through drainage and an interventional radiology going also sometimes transgastric. So trying to avoid an operation could be using minimal invasive surgery and finally as a last step, using an open approach. This kind of so-called step-up approach seems to be the best uh, that exists. But again, every case is different. What I think I can say, um, I would be very careful to be sure the cause of the pancreatitis is identified. Uh, probably the most common cause of pancreatitis is gallstone related, so bas basically biliary stone, gallbladder stone. The second one is probably related to alcohol, but then there are pancreatitis related by pre-cancer or cancer condition. 
So obviously to identify the cause of a pancreatitis is crucial because sometimes can be the first symptoms or the expression of something that is going on and is not good. So don't forget about that. It's very rare to have a pancreatitis related to a malignancy, extremely rare. But uh, you know, so the first two causes, stones in the gallbladder and alcohol related is probably the most common, uh, are the most common cause. And the treatment is generally when possible, minimal invasive. So drain, percutaneous drainage or transgastric drainage by endoscopist. Um, and I see now the answer, yes. Uh, so that's, I think, is an appropriate approach. I mean, first IR and then probably was not enough and they went to surgery as a second, as a second option. Very quick answer to anonymous. The organization that suggests hospital for treatment is National Pancreas Foundation. So on the website of National Pancreas Foundation, it's possible clicking on states that are gray, it's possible to identify the center that have been um, uh, you know, identified by the National Pancreas Foundation as a center of excellence. That doesn't mean there are no others, but as I think is a very valid tools to try to be driven a little bit through that. And then I want to finish in the, in, the, in the surgical field, like laparoscopy should be done in the nose of pancreatic cancer. This is a very long debate that has been over time. We personally don't use laparoscopy if not in selected cases. So we don't use in every case. Why? Because there are several studies showing that there are limitations in what you really can identify with laparoscopy. And today with a, you know, with big improvement in the, you know, mo diagnostic modality, like scan, like, you know, blood tests, C99, the best chemotherapy we have before is very rare to find surprises at surgery. There are centers that use that. I would not define that a mistake. I think it's a strategy. We believe that in our experience doesn't really give you too much more, but I believe it's something, you know, can be done and, if it's done, I, I don't have anything against. Let's say it's not our approach, normal approach, but sometimes we do. Great, Mark. I think there's a question about idiopathic pancreatitis. Yeah, so this is actually, uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. I, I, have, I have my personal opinion in idiopathic pancreatitis. And again, I want to be very clear that this is my opinion. Uh, we generally call idiopathic something that we don't know. So it's the same story of uh, hepatitis C uh, that was called idiopathic hepatitis until we discovered the hepatitis C virus, right? So I believe that everything has a cause. And we call idiopathic what we don't know. Not because as a doctor, we are no good. Maybe the medicine doesn't know yet a cause of something. And this is actually is what makes tricky the treatment of those kind of pancreatitis because you, you, you don't know the enemy, right? I mean, you know there is a problem. You are afraid that the problem can happen again. And I'm sure that, I mean, who experienced that knows that this can be a really a serious problem. But unfortunately, there is not so much you can do to avoid the recurrence because you don't know the cause. My suggestion for idiopathic pancreatitis, I agree. Genetic testing is very important because sometimes that can be the cause of pancreatitis. Sometimes it's important to check metabolism. There are conditioning, metabolism of people that can lead to pancreatitis. For example, having a high level of fat in the blood or having a high level of calcium in the blood that are metabolic disease. So there is a reason why that happens, right? Or, you know, sometimes there are medicine, drugs that people use for treatment of diseases that can be cause of pancreatitis. So again, I think the secret here is to go in a center of excellence for the treatment of those diseases and be screened completely, right? I mean, what generally the normal, you know, doctor look for is, as I told you before, the most common cause, gallstone, so basically stone in the gallbladder and alcohol. But of course, it's very difficult for everyone that is not, for anyone that is not super specialized in something to really go deep in detail. And therefore, I think at this point, especially when you have a diagnosis like idiopathic, 
is very worth to go in a center with high volume of treatment of those disease and really trying to get all the possible tests, excluding all the cause, including for sure the genetic test. I believe genetic test is especially important when pancreatitis happens in young age, not only, but that says it become a very important cause even for other issues because hereditary pancreatitis that, uh, you know, with onset in children, some one of those genetic pancreatitis can also be a pretty important risk factor for pancreatic cancer in older uh, people. Well, Marco, I think we're at that five o'clock hour. Yeah. Um, perhaps folks in the National Pancreas Foundation can send us further questions through email or something like that if others come up. I think we hit, we hit um, almost all of them. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember if, uh, if in the, do, did we have one hour or two hour time? Can, it was an hour and 15 minutes, an hour, hour to an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, oh, okay. So I, believe, I believe actually that if we don't have any other question, I think uh, that has been a very interesting discussion. Um, I don't think, do, do we have any question from uh, some one of you at the National Pancreatic Foundation? I don't have any questions, but I wanted to thank you both for your excellent presentation and for being so supportive of the National Pancreas Foundation. I actually want to thank you again for the amazing work that you are doing. And I think uh, supporting and helping um, patient for, for, you know, for their decision is extremely important. I don't know if you want to also send, one of the questions was, how can I found information, which center, if you want to send Privately, I mean, to the, those people, I mean, the, the, your website, because I yes. think, uh, you know, I showed just a picture, but I think maybe your website could be very useful because there they can find all the information uh, they yes. want. Yes, we will do that. And we will also send this to all the registered participants. Um, this will also be on YouTube, um, probably by tomorrow afternoon, um, so that they can send to people that might be interested in watching it as well. Yeah, and oh, I see we have also participants from Australia. I saw now in the chat. Oh, okay, I didn't see the chat. Did a, did another question just come in or did you catch them all? Uh, uh, someone had asked what exactly what type of genetic testing should be requested. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's around pancreatitis or in general, Marco. No, I think it's pancreatitis. And I think, you know, for this question, I think uh, the best option again is to go in a center of excellence, speaking with a GI doctor specialized in the treatment of hereditary pancreatitis and get tested. So, you know, there are several, some one are more important than other, but I believe that that's a really need to be, you know, I, I don't want to use a chat for medical advice. I think it's not the right place to do that. And I think, I mean, it should be, you know, defined by, by someone, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis in, in a proper consultation. And, uh, but definitely there is a battery of different tests that can be done. There are several kinds of different uh, um, hereditary pancreatitis. Okay, if that's all the questions, again, thank you both for um, joining us tonight and for your support with your medical center as well. Um, and like I said, we will email all the participants. If there's further questions, please reach out to info at pancreasfoundation.org and we'll be happy to direct you. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.